So we're in Ecclesiastes now. I'm going to run through Ecclesiastes quicker than I did Proverbs. And you honestly, some of that's just personal preference. I, I wish it wasn't, but I don't read Ecclesiastes anywhere near as much as I read Proverbs. And I maybe I should hang my head in shame, but I hardly ever read Song of Solomon. <laughs> um, so, but I mean that's that's reality. So Ecclesiastes is the search for purpose. Um, author. There are two lines of evidence, external evidence and internal evidence. Internal means within the book. Uh, that point to Solomon as the author of Ecclesiastes. For the external evidence, Jewish tradition attributes Ecclesiastes to Solomon. So when we say external, we're looking at what people say in history. Internally, a number of lines of evidence show that Solomon was surely the author. First, the author identifies himself as the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Then references in the book to the author's unrivaled wisdom, um, his extreme wealth, his opportunities for pleasure, extensive building activities, all suggest or point to Solomon as the author. There's simply no other descendant of David who even came close to these descriptions. Uh, when did he write it? According to Jewish tradition, he wrote the Song of Solomon in his early years, expressing a young man's love for his bride. He wrote Proverbs in <coughs> his mature years, manifesting a middle-aged man's wisdom. He reportedly wrote Ecclesiastes in his declining years, revealing an old man's sorrow. I think that's a very, very um, excellent insight, probably accurate insight. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. <laughs> what is Solomon's testimony? Did he finish... The ch did, he meet, did he meet the challenge to end well? No, he ended horrifically, kind of like what you were saying earlier. All those years leading up, and then he basically committed apostasy. I don't know how else you can put it. And the question, of course, is, is Solomon in heaven? I don't know. I hope so. I think so. Let, we'll just have to leave that up to God. So uh, perhaps Ecclesiastes is the record of Solomon's regret regret for and repentance from his grave moral lapses, which <coughs> you can read about in 1 Kings 11. The book of Ecclesiastes then would have been written just before his death and the subsequent division of his kingdom that occurred in 931 BC. Uh, the title the name Ecclesiastes stems from the title given in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Define our, uh, uh, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament for Greek-speaking Jews. Septuagint is Greek 470, and that means that um, 70 scribes in Alexandria, Egypt, translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek for Greek-speaking Jews living in Alexandria, Egypt, the northern part of Egypt, uh, that spoke only Greek at that time. But the Septuagint is usually written as the LXX. Or 70. There was actually 72 scribes, but they, they um, uh, what's when you uh, round, round it off. off? Yeah, so they rounded it off to LXX, <clears throat> which to make us really confused is Roman numeral mm. for 70. But in, in um, commentaries and literature, you often see it written as LXX, and that's the Septuagint. Much of the New Testament, when it quotes the Old Testament, is quoting the Septuagint. 
because that is the Bible that the apostles read. They read the Greek the translation okay. of the Hebrew Old Testament. Okay. Not entirely, but many of the quotes in the New Testament, when you read them and then go back to the Old Testament, the wording is somewhat different, and that explains it because they're translating the Hebrew Old uh, the, the, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, they're translating it into Greek. So that, that's an overview of, of the Old Testament and New Testament. The Greek term Ecclesiastes means assembly, ecclesia. Um, and uh, the Hebrew title is Koholeth, uh, which means one who convenes and speaks at an assembly or an ecclesiastic or preachers. So you see a lot of, uh, for example, commentaries call Solomon uh, the preacher. They refer to Ecclesiastes as the preacher. So that, that helps us to understand <clears throat> why. I needed that review myself uh, because it can get confusing. The theme and purpose, the basic theme of Ecclesiastes is the futility of life apart from God futility of life apart from God. Solomon is admitting that he went out and experienced it all and it was vanity of vanities, right? You see that often in Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities. It's all vain unless you have a relationship with God. And what does he say? Fear God. That's, that's the ultimate. So, um, what was this? It, the um, Futility of life. Futility of life. So number one is futility of <clears throat> life apart from God. So what we're going to see then is, is Ecclesiastes is really becomes an apologetics book. So a lot of the early church fathers that were apologists which means an apologist doesn't mean you apologize, it means you defend. From the Greek word apologia, which is where we get apologetics from, is a defense of the faith. It's a rational defense of the faith. So you had in the, um, the early church, um, you know, the early 100s, 200s, 300s, suffering persecution, a lot of apologists rise up and they're writing uh, books for non-Christians and government officials saying, you know, this is why the Christian faith is valid. And it's why it doesn't make sense for you to persecute us. So you had a generation of apologetic uh, teachers that rose up right the early part of the Christian faith. So what we have today um, is, a, is a tradition of 2,000 years. Um, I think it was Irenaeus was, an, um, Irenaeus was a theologian and a poly, uh, um, wrote a lot of apologetics, but who's the other guy? Um, can't remember the name right off hand. So the basic theme of Ecclesiastes, the futility of life apart from God, in the development of this theme, four key purposes emerge. First, paragraph number two, in seeking to demonstrate that life without God has no meaning, Solomon is seeking to remove confidence in man-based achievements and wisdom. He shows that all of man's goals, apart from God, will eventually lead to dissatisfaction and emptiness. So, Obviously, Ecclesiastes is brilliant in that regard. And it is an important book. I need to read it um, more. I was quoting Ecclesiastes 12.13 uh, just a moment ago where he ends Ecclesiastes by saying, The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. Verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. What a way to end it, yeah? And, and that's what Jesus says. Uh, the, the, the secrets of men's hearts will be disclosed. Maybe he was thinking of that verse right there. 
Solomon, paragraph three, one of the richest, um, most revered and successful men who have ever lived. Solomon would, would be equivalent to a Bill Gates, no doubt about it, or Jeffrey Bezos of Amazon. Uh, that's how wealthy he was, but he would have been viewed as maybe, you know, think of one of the most brilliant uh, professors um, in the world. Solomon would have been viewed that way as well, extremely wise. So uh, recorded the futility and emptiness of his own experiences to, to persuade his readers to seek God. Um, I corrected that, to make persuade, um, to persuade his readers to seek God. Second, paragraph number four in your notes, Solomon seeks to show that much in life cannot be fully understood by man a fallen creature with limited understanding. A fallen creature with limited understanding. But wasn't that the message of Job? That uh, Job's friends, who were self-assured and self-righteous, knew what Job's problem was, and they were wrong. And even Job didn't fully understand why he was going through what he was going through. That's, I think, the message of the whole Bible, but especially is it the message of Ecclesiastes. Consequence, consequently, the godly man must live by faith and not by sight, by his own understanding. That's what we read about in Proverbs uh, 3, verses 4 and 5, or 5 and 6, I should say. Thus, there is much similarity with Job. Third, Ecclesiastes shows that there are exceptions to the laws and promises of of Proverbs, at least from the standpoint of this life. So, for example, Proverbs 10, verse 16, affirms that justice is meted out to the righteous and the wicked, but Proverbs, Ecclesi but Ecclesiastes 8, 14, observes that this is not always the case, at least not in the, this life. So let's look at Proverbs, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, Ecclesiastes, um, chapter 8, verse 14. He says uh, in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 14, there, there is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say this too is futility. Basically, the righteous suffer at the hands of the wicked. And, and Solomon says this is wrong, but this is what happens in this life. So are these contradictions? Not at all, because Proverbs focuses on the general laws of God, while Ecclesiastes cautions against insisting that in a sinful world, those general laws must always be counted on. So there's... There's a different focus of Ecclesiastes than there is on Proverbs. Context, context, context. So whenever you see a, alleged contradictions, always keep in mind context. For example, in the Gospels you have, um, you have one Gospel writer saying, um, referring to an angel at the, at the tomb of Jesus who speaks to the women he is not here, he is risen. In another gospel, you have two angels, but only one speaks. So you have, you know, different eyewitness accounts are going to focus on different things. It doesn't mean that they're contradictory. It means that one person sees it this way, another person sees it this way. One person says it's important to point out that there are two angels, but the other gospel writer says, shows us that only one angel spoke. Could have had two angels, and only one speaks. And then I think another gospel says they said, and yet it could be that they both spoke or that they only one spoke. Uh, Michael, you had I was just going to say, like, this just shows how important it is to, to remember, which is what you, the point you just made, to remember the context. Especially, yeah. the, I, for a long time, my biggest problem was with people and, and talking to people with faith is they say, well, the Bible contradicts itself all the time. Yeah. And I had 
being unlearned and not a Bible reader, et cetera, et cetera, I had no challenges to come back at them with. Yeah. Um, and, but since the principles of Bible study class, to go in and I mean, I, now I've gone and done research on these contradictions. And just in the reading that I've done, now, now that I am more learned, now that I am able to read the Bible better, it's amazing how like just like those two verses that you talk about here as yeah. an example, like one of the verses used as a contradiction is in a totally different context. And I would I mean I would argue more than eighty percent of Christians wouldn't be able to make that defense. It just goes to it like so few people are taught how to read the Bible correctly. Yeah. And it's so important, especially because like my own brother is one of them who has sat there and argued with me. Well, the Bible says this and it says this. How can and it used to infuriate me that I couldn't just come back and well come da, da, da. and now I just I'm just waiting for like a conversation like that to happen because you know now I now I'm armed and it's just a shame that more people aren't armed with that kind of knowledge. Great, great points, and that that is in direct contradiction to what uh, the Apostle Peter tells us in, I believe it's 1 Peter 3.15. Um, <clears throat> he says, but sanctify Christ in Christ as Lord in your hearts. That is, to set him apart. Um, always being ready to make a defense. That, that's the Greek word, apologia. So it's, it's a reasoned intellectual defense based upon sound theology and a knowledge of the Word of God to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The word gentle is the Greek word for humble. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Bob is going to teach on the... Um, the um, um, the Sermon on the Mount, the uh, Beatitudes. So one of those Beatitudes is blessed are the, sometimes it's translated as meek, um, sometimes gentle, but really is humble. Uh, one, prautes is the word where uh, one who um, is... Um, I get, I get the definitions confused with, with bondservant. But basically, Proutes is, is one, is like a horse who um, is, you take a powerful horse that has a bridle, that horse is useful, but if you don't have a bridle on the saddle, the horse is not useful. So, boy, I need to, I need to refresh my memory on that, that word. Let me see if I wrote it down in uh, Matthew. My problem is that I I have three Bibles and one I have no access to any longer and most of the definitions are in that Bible and this is my new Bible. Blessed are the gentle. There it is. Okay, I've got it. Um, so the Greek word is prautes P-R-A-U-T-E-S and um, it's the humility which is strength under control. It's the fruit of the Spirit which enables the believer to place the will of God before personal rights. Mm -hmm. that's, that's this word for humility. There's more to the definition than that. But the humility which is strength under control. The fruit of the Spirit which enables the believer to place the will of God before personal rights. I think that's the word... Uh, that Peter uses in 1 Peter 3, 15. Um, but he says, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. So they're not, they're not necessarily saying, tell me why you have this hope, but your brother was basically challenging you and and challenging you to give an account for why you believe, for the hope that is in you. He's not saying that he recognizes the hope in you, although mm -hmm. he, he probably recognizes but wouldn't admit it, but 
he is challenging you. Otherwise, why would Peter say yet with gentleness and reverence, mm -hmm. right? So that what's presumed in this verse is that you're being attacked. Yeah. And, and yet Peter says, no, don't respond in kind. When they, help, when they come at you hard, be able to respond with humility and reverence. And I'll never forget, I, I think I shared this in class that time when I had a major debate with Abdul in um, Hyde Park, London. I shared that with you in this class, didn't I? No? So it was, it was um, Hyde Park has had decades of something called Speaker's Corner. So Hyde Park in London is a massive park, like most of the parks in London, but in a certain area, oh, probably, you know, if you start with this building and go out to the field and beyond, it's huge. And there are certain areas where guys literally get up on little step ladders and you'll, back in the day, you'd have communists, you had socialists, you had Marxists, I think you probably still have them out there today, but you have Christians, you have people that think they're Martians, I mean, just, you go to different areas and they're just up there speaking, but, but now you have Muslims. So the Muslims are out there and they're hyper aggressive. And they will, they will, if you're a Christian, they will mock you, they will ridicule you, they'll shout you down, um, they'll get in your face. It is very intense. And so when Maureen and I were on vacation in England, I knew I wanted to go to Speaker's Corner. And I used to open air preach in my college days. So we get out there, and I'm not thinking I'm going to preach, but um, but I I walk past this Muslim clerk. He's dressed in white. He's got the whatever that thing is called, and he's he is as pompous as you can imagine. Just the arrogance just oozed out of him, mm -hmm. and he says loudly. All of you are slaves. Some of you are slaves to this, and some of you are slaves to that, and some of you are slaves to this, and I'm thinking, you're right. So there's about 20 people there, <laughs> and I'm in the back, and I raise my hand, and I say, I too am a slave, like that. And he's like, what? He said, what are you a slave of? And I said, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who alone can give eternal life. I mean, I just... Boom, out of it, just boom, boldness. And he, he and, I, and I start walking up to him. And he, ah, you're a slave of Jesus Christ. Ah, and he starts to ridicule me and mock me. And he's going on and on. So I move up right up to him and I raise my hand to shake his hand. Well, he can't just ignore me now. He has to shake my hand. And I said, my name is... is um, I think I said my name is Pastor Brad Abley from California. And he goes like this and he said, I'm sorry, I didn't know that you're a pastor. I did that strategically because he wouldn't shut his mouth. He wouldn't stop mocking me. Why? Because I put him on his heels. Mm -hmm. Because I, I brought such boldness and authority, but, but with gentleness and reverence. I didn't mock him. Um, he would put the Bible down, I wouldn't put the Quran down. And I wouldn't mock um, Muhammad, although it's easy to do that. Because I knew that that, that was just gonna get us, us off. I stayed with what his accusations were about scripture and contradictions. So he backed off at that point, and that was the wisdom of the Holy Spirit because then it kind of put us on a level playing field even though he was on that step ladder. So we start debating the Trinity, the deity of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, scriptures, accuracy versus the Quran. I mean, it was all heavy duty stuff. And before we knew it, Maureen standing there right next to me, she's praying in the spirit nonstop for an hour and a half. The crowd within 30 minutes doubles in size, then it triples in size, then it it quadrupled. There must have been 300 people out there. We started off with 20. And it, this is, an, it's nonstop, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But I noticed that 
though in my mind I was not, I, my goal was not to win the argument. My goal was to win him. And what would happen is he would throw out something and I would answer it, but it was always with gentleness and reverence. And I had an experience that was like, it was, I can only describe it as if it was an out of body experience. I don't know if it was literal or not, but I think it was. It was a spiritual event where I could see myself, um, I could see myself engaging with him and I could see the people and, and there was a spirit of sincerity which was upon me, which was not upon him and the crowd could see it. So I knew I had the crowd and then to his right, he had about 20 young disciples. So I was aware of that and I was preaching to them, although I wouldn't necessarily look at them. And then the most bizarre thing, still to this day, standing at, to his right, was a Jewish man who is more hostile to Christianity than even Abdul was. So I'm having to deal with Abdul and this Jewish British man who is white. It was, it was just, it was bizarre. So I'm dealing with Abdul, then, then this British man who's just got poison flying out of him. But every time Abdul would challenge me with a question and I'd answer it, he would turn and speak to his followers in Arabic. And it kept happening over and over and over. It was getting frustrating to me. Well, a young British guy comes up to me and he whispers in my ear and he says, I can see you're getting frustrated, but don't worry. Every time he does that, he's trying to unhook his disciples because he knows, mm. basically, he can't argue with you. He knows that you're right, but he's trying to protect them from your truth. So I said, is that why you don't see very many imams engaging with evangelicals in open debates? It's well, they hard do to argue with the truth. They do in in Hyde Park, boy. I'll tell you, they really? they because they're very arrogant and they think they know it all. So you, if you're going to stand with them, you can't be mealy mouth. You have to be tough, and yet. You still you have to know the word. word of God, because then you, if you, there's such a spiritual battle, because if you step into that realm of pride, now you've got the Holy Spirit resisting you, and it shows. So it took everything within me to not respond in kind, and Maureen's praying in the Spirit the whole time, and I got others praying, you could just tell. So <clears throat> an hour and a half goes by, and... Um, I mean, he's he's just exasperated. He he cannot, no matter what he says. The Holy Spirit just gave me wisdom to overcome it. But in my heart, I'm not I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm not even happy that I'm winning the argument. I want this guy to come to faith in Christ, and I'm I'm full of faith that he will. So, after an hour and a half, Maureen whispers into my ear, and she says, "Brad, we've got to go." We have tickets for, I think it was for one of the, the Broadway shows in Covent Garden. Mm -hmm. And so I reached up to Abdul to shake his hand again, and I said, I've got to go now. But I want to end with this last thing. I said, there's one major difference, Abdul, between you and me. And he says, well, what is that? And I said, when I pray, I know that God answers my prayers and he hears me, but when you pray, you're not confident that Allah hears your prayers. God hears your prayers, does he? Well, what language does he speak to you in? And I said, he speaks to me in English. But when you give your life to Isa Abdul, he will speak to you in your mother tongue and in English as well. And he was so... Um, he, he... It just threw him for a loop. He, he, for the first time, he, he was just dumbfounded. He didn't know what to say. And I took advantage of that because he wasn't speaking to his disciples. And I turned to them and I said, there's no hope for you 
in Islam. You do not have your sins covered. You do not have eternal life. You do not know God the Father. But if you will give your life to Jesus Christ today and ask him to forgive you and be your Lord and Savior, you'll find eternal life. And it was, it was as if God froze time for that moment. It's like time, it was, it was, it's hard to explain. It was like I could look into their eyes. I think I recall even young women were a part of them. And it's as if I could see in their eyes them saying, this man's right. And then I turned and we walked away and we just, I swear we must have floated out of Hyde Park. <laughs> it was just, I forget about this, but it was one of the greatest spiritual victories I've ever experienced in my life. But you know what? I never knew I was going to end up doing that. But it was because I had studied the Word of God faithfully that God knew it. And the Holy Spirit just, boom, gave me that boldness. And I, I, it was like I was outside of myself. I didn't even know what I was doing. I said, I too am a slave. What are you a slave of? I'm a slave of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Who alone can give me trust? I said, just like that. He said, Bah, you're a Christian, huh? And then he starts mocking me. And that's when I, the Holy Spirit gave me the idea. Tell him you're a pastor. And, and that, was, that was it. Amazing. So the point is, when you take the Word of God seriously and you study to show yourself approved, you just don't know. I said all that to say this. You don't know what opportunities will come your way. And there have been hundreds of situations where I've witnessed to people and had that same situation happen where they say, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. And I say, can you give me one? Well, I, uh, I don't know. I just know that they're full. Have you ever read the Bible? Well, just <laughs> so I, I just throw it out. And one time I was witnessing at San Jose State, I was preaching open air and a Mormon came up to me and said that. And I said, if you can show me one contradiction, I will renounce my faith on the spot. Hmm. And the people around me were like, oh my gosh, this is, it was intense. And he brought up a good alleged contradiction. Thank God I had studied it, didn't throw me off. And I was able to say, um, let me take you, this is from Acts 9. So I said, okay, well, let me take you to Acts 22 and show you that what seems like a contradiction is no contradiction at all. And, and then, but I should have said, now when you renounce your faith in Mormonism and become a Christian, you know, you think about all those things you could have said afterwards. Hindsight. Oh. Yeah, hindsight. <laughs> so all that, you know, that's, that's one of the benefits of us studying the Old Testament. Because you, people are going to say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. The God of the New Testament is a God of love. You know, on and on. We just saw a situation where God could have led the king of Israel to slaughter the Arameans that he had in his hand. But Elisha said, mm, no, we're not going to do that here. So context. Um, <clears throat> context of the Bible, context of verses, context of ages, and how God worked in this dispensation is different than how he worked in another dispensation. That doesn't mean he's different. It means that he he responds to cultures and times and seasons differently according to the need and according to their hearts and according to all these things. Um, those are what make the difference. Questions or comments on all that? No, I love hearing those type of victories. That's good stuff. <laughs> I didn't tell you that story about no, I love it. Park one. I, I did. Yeah, I love it. I'm I glad I did. I was going to punt on that because I thought, well, I've already shared that. Um, it brings a smile to my that was a long time ago that was 2001 I think it was just after not long after 9-11 no, it was, it was a 2003 I, I, when I wrote you the email I, I, you know I was under a lot of pressure last week you know, sometimes I'm reading I'm not deriving any knowledge or understanding and I know it I'm just reading it Yeah. and that's what was happening Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday it's just Stop and I had to stop and actually, all right, it's time to break up the big guns. And then I prayed, yeah. And I asked for knowledge and understanding. Now I preached that to my my personnel, being professors and instructors. 
you have six levels within the cognitive domain of learning, and uh, knowledge is the very first one, which is merely a regurgitation of facts, figures, mm -hmm. and concepts. It's memory. Mm -hmm. It's the understanding is key to possessing that knowledge. You can have a lot of knowledge, but if you, have, if you lack understanding, yeah. it doesn't lead to wisdom. You are just an encyclopedia spewing forth rote memorization. Yeah. So that's what you have that I am, I don't say envious, I want it. I yeah. want that understanding and I want that, that power that scripture brings to be able to have those discussions, not fights, but yeah. discussions. <clears throat> well, it's just, I think it goes back to what we, how we started off in Proverbs 2, just saying, putting our place, ourselves in a low place and just saying, I know nothing, you know everything. Uh, your word says to cry out for wisdom and discernment and understanding, so I'm going to do that. But I'm going to immerse myself in Proverbs so that I know when to speak and when not to speak and how to respond in situations. And, but, of course, Proverbs isn't the only place. Um, we just read 1 Peter 3.15. Um, yeah, so... Well, it's a shame because we believe that our, you know... Our, our religion is the truth, but you've got Mormons and Muslims and, and Jewish people and you know Orthodox Jewish people, all these other all these other religions and sects who are like sponges when it comes to their doctrine. Yeah. Like you talk to any average Muslim and he knows the Quran like you, like you can't believe. Mm -hmm. But you speak to the average Christian and they know two or three, you know, they know John three sixteen and Philippians four, you know, and it's, yeah, and it's a shame. It's a shame that, you know, we stand in the belief that we are right and we are truth and everybody, you know, but we can't latch onto the truth like they can, and it's it, a shame. It uh, all I can do is shake my head. Yeah, I just think how, how can it be where. We not only have the truth, but the truth dwells on the inside of us. And it's, for years, all I can just do is shake my head. It's just, yeah. but there's going to be a day of reckoning. Mm -hmm. there, there absolutely will be. 